The royal function includes everything that in the social order is properly referred to as the government. With regard to its regulatory and stabilizing function, it must ensure the maintenance of internal order, and with regard to its function of protecting the social organism, it must maintain outward order. These two constituent elements of the royal power are symbolized in diverse traditions respectively by the scales and the sword. As for the priesthood, its essential function is the conservation and transmission of the traditional doctrine, in which every regular society finds its fundamental principles. The true function of the priesthood, then, is above all one of knowledge and teaching, and its mission is not only to conserve it integrally, but also to communicate it to all who are fit to receive it, to distribute it hierarchically, according to the intellectual capacity of each. All traditional doctrines, whether Eastern or Western, are unanimous in affirming the superiority and even the transcendence of knowledge in relation to action. The hierarchical difference between the priesthood and royalty lies in the fact that the priesthood receives its power directly from the source, whereas royalty can receive its power only through the intermediary of the priesthood. This hierarchy is shown in the parable of the blind man and the lame man. We should note that it is the blind man who plays the leading role in the association of the two men, and that his very position, mounted on the blind man's shoulders, symbolizes the superiority of contemplation over action, a superiority that Confucius himself was far from disputing in principle, as is shown in an account of his meeting with Lao Tzu, in which he admitted that he was not born to knowledge. We must note in China the distinction between Taoism, which is a purely metaphysical doctrine, and Confucianism, which is a social doctrine. Both proceed from the same tradition, and correspond very exactly to the distinction between the spiritual and temporal. The same thing was taught, even outwardly, in the Western Middle Ages. Indeed, St. Thomas Aquinas expressly declares that all human functions are subordinate to contemplation as their superior end, so that when considered properly, they all seem to be in the service of those who contemplate the truth. In order to subsist, temporal power needs a consecration that comes from spiritual authority. It is this consecration that gives it legitimacy, that is to say, conformity with the very order of things. It is in this that the divine right of kings properly consists, what the Far Eastern tradition calls the mandate of heaven. The dependence of the temporal power on the spiritual authority has its visible sign in the anointing of kings, who are not truly legitimized until they have received investiture and consecration from the hands of the priesthood, implying the transmission of a spiritual influence necessary for the regular exercise of their functions. The king, then, is merely a depository of this influence and consequently can lose it in certain circumstances, which explains why, in the Christendom of the Middle Ages, the Pope could release subjects from their oath of allegiance to their sovereign. In exchange for the guarantee of their power by the spiritual authority, the Kshatriyas must use this power to ensure that the Brahmins will have the means to peacefully accomplish their proper function of knowledge and teaching sheltered from trouble and agitation. Dante, in De Monarchia, assigns to the Emperor and to the Pope, respectively, the functions of leading mankind to the terrestrial paradise and to the celestial paradise. The first of these two functions accomplished according to philosophy, and the second according to revelation. This is shown in the two keys of Janus in ancient Rome, the attributes of the sovereign pontiff. These two keys are at the same time those of spiritual and temporal power. The relationship between these two powers may be expressed by saying that the Pope must keep for himself the golden key to the celestial paradise, and entrust to the Emperor the silver key to the terrestrial paradise. And, as we just saw, the symbolism of the second key is sometimes replaced by that of the scepter, the insignia belonging more particularly to royalty. One sees that the two keys, considered as those of knowledge of the metaphysical and physical orders, really both belong to the spiritual authority, and that it is only delegation, so to speak, that the second is entrusted to the holders of royal power.
Since we have spoken of the mandate of heaven, it will not be out of place to end with that which, according to Confucius himself, this mandate was to be carried out. In order to make the natural virtues shine in the hearts of all men, the ancient princes first of all applied themselves to governing their own principality well. In order to govern their principality well, they first restored proper order in their families. In order to establish proper order in their families, they worked hard at perfecting themselves first. In order to perfect themselves, they first regulated the movement of their hearts. To regulate the movement of their hearts, they first perfected their will. To perfect their will, they developed their knowledge to the highest degree. One develops knowledge by scrutinizing the nature of things. Once the nature of things is scrutinized, knowledge attains its highest degree. Knowledge having arrived at its highest degree, will becomes perfect. Will being perfect, the movements of the heart are controlled. The movements of the heart having been controlled, every man is free of faults. After having corrected oneself, one establishes order in the family. With order reigning in the family, the principality is well governed. With the principality being well governed, the empire soon enjoys peace.